The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, jellyfish alien monsters from three universes over. And hey, those are not furries. Tree cats released in a madhouse science fiction convention. Bullets and magic, ice crowns and immortality. Plus, part 21 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up, we have an interview with Larry Correa, creator of the Monster Hunter series and author of Warbound, the latest entry in the Grim Noir Chronicles. This is a gritty alternate history, urban fantasy, horror, action adventure, yep, all those things, set in a very cool version of 1933. And, of course, we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. But first, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. The Ides of August are approaching, and it's time to sharpen up those daggers of the mind with some great reading. How's that for a mixed metaphor? Bain has a whole passel of mass market paperbacks new this month at booksellers everywhere. Laura, lead us to the treasure house. Well, our lead mass market for the month is John Ringo's Queen of Wands. This is the sequel to Princess of Wands, and it's an action-adventure fantasy with a couple of supernatural detectives hunting demons in modern-day Chattanooga and Atlanta. That's the that's the one that partly takes place at Dragon Con, right? Right. Well, it's sort of a dream world Dragon Con, but yes. So for those of us who are hopelessly mundane, what is Dragon Con, Laura, and why could... Why would John Ringo use it for a setting? Dragon Con is basically Mardi Gras for nerds. It's one of the biggest volunteer-organized conventions of its type in the country. It takes place over Labor Day weekend every year in Atlanta, spread out over five hotels now, and they cover books, music, movies, TV shows, uh, science, all related to science fiction, fantasy, horror. So it's ginormous. It is. Ginormous, like... Tens of thousands of people. Yes, at least around 50,000 every year, and and it's growing every year. Wow. Mm -hmm. Also in August are a couple of classics. We have Robert A. Heinlein's Assignment in Eternity, which is uh, two Heinlein tales in one volume. Those are Gulf and Lost Legacy. This is the book about the problems with immortality, among other things. Heinlein has an insightful take on that, of course. And there's an Andre Norton omnibus, Ice and Shadow, This one contains two Norton novels, Ice Crown and Brother to Shadows. Ice Crown has an interesting plot where a human archaeologist has to save an alien race that's been brainwashed into slavery. Sounds interesting. Also, we don't want to forget a new trade paperback, Fire Season. Oh yeah, we didn't get that one in the list last time when we were doing hardcovers and trade paperbacks for August. Yep, it's by David Weber and Jane Linskold, and it's book two in the Star Kingdom series by David Weber. This is a series about Honor Harrington's ancestor, Stephanie Harrington, when Stephanie is a tween. Tween, is that another word for a child? Well, I think it means she's 13 or 14 years old. Ah, preteen, yes, another YA category. But this is a great book for any age. It takes place on Sphinx, kind of the other planet in the Manticore system, right? Right. Okay, there you have it, the August Mass Market Paperbacks and a great trade paperback set in David Weber's Honorverse, all at Booksellers Now. I want to welcome Larry Correa back to the podcast. Hi, Larry. Hey, Tony. Larry Correa is, of course, the author of the best-selling Monster Hunter series. There are four of these so far, and a fifth, we hope, that is furiously flowing forth from Larry's metaphorical pen at this moment. Uh, These begin with Monster Hunter International, with latest entry Monster Hunter Legion, and Monster Hunter Nemesis on the horizon for 2014. Right, Larry? That is correct. Yes, I'm working on Monster Hunter Nemesis now. Some of y'all may not be aware out there that Larry has two other Bane series. Um, One is co-written with Mike Capari, 
and is called what are we calling Deep Six and upcoming Swords of Exodus that series? Larry? No, we've never actually named the series. It was just you know Dead Six and Swords of Exodus. So I guess this is the uh, the Valentine and Lorenzo show. Um, I don't think we actually have an official title. That's for it. Yeah, let's, Valentine. Oh, and, for the moment, we can call it the Valentine and Lorenzo series, maybe. So. Yeah, that works great, and because uh, it's really just a, it's a character it's a character study of these two. Uh, really bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> Deadly guys, at least. So uh, that's coming up in, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, September. September. That's sure, a sep- Swords of Exodus. That's a September book, and we'll want to talk maybe with you and Mike about that if we can squeeze it in. Oh yeah, he's on he's on active duty right now, but he will be back in September. Oh cool. Well, we hope we can do that. So, uh, yeah, like you say, these are gritty and bloody, but also they're you know they're kind of fun and rollicking military adventures too, Larry. <laughs> So. No, I, I had a lot of fun with them. Uh, we we had a we had a blast with that series. All right, uh, we got one more planned, and uh, it's going to be pretty awesome. And uh, uh, so far, people are reading the e arc for Swords of Exodus, and all the reviews have been really positive so far. I mean, everybody's really been enjoying it. So, and the other Korea created series is the Grimnor Chronicles. These include Hard Magic, Spellbound, and latest entry Warbound which is a new Bane hardcover just out at booksellers everywhere. Larry, the Grimnor Chronicle books are hard to classify. We kind of think of them around here as urban fantasy crossed with alternate history, crossed with detective noir, and maybe there's kind of superhero stories as well. Can you give us some kind of summary of the general storyline of the series for those that might not know it? Yeah, it's. Uh, I think of it kind of as an alternate history fantasy and what it is, it's set in the 1930s. It's kind of a hard-boiled uh, 1930s story. Uh, and the world, it diverged from our world in the 1850s. Magical powers began to appear uh, across the world. And uh, basically these people have uh, the ability to alter one specific part of the laws of physics. And as time has gone on, the, the numbers of people with magic has, has increased. Uh, it's diverged more and more from our timeline because of that. Until we get to 1932, where the first book starts, and it's about one in a thousand, or about one in a hundred people has some form of magic, and about one in a thousand has uh, some really impressive abilities. And so the world has changed because of this, and I'm a history geek, I got to have a lot of fun with that. So it's kind of altered history, it's kind of hard boiled, um, noir, you know, it's kind of my love song to Ray- Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. So imagine if those guys in the 1930s were writing urban fantasy. That's kind of what this is. Yeah. A little bit of a little bit of sci-fi. Um, I mean, ultimately, your magic is has a as a rational explanation. Yeah, it actually, that, when you get to that point, when you realize that the magic is actually uh, well, hence the title, hard magic, because you know, in, uh, in usually in fantasy, you have hard magic systems and soft magic systems where, you know, there's a lot of magic or a little magic and there's hard rules or, you know, they're not. This, the magic has a lot of hard rules. And when you get to that point, you realize it's actually, I kind of do base it on um, on science. So I have a lot of fun with it. And I just, you know, violate the heck out of physics. Um, so, yeah, there is that element there. there. Like I said, there is a science fiction element from where magic comes from and the uh, the problems associated with that. And uh, so... It gets it gets pretty cool. I get a little uh, little alternate universe action going on there. I mean, I get to <laughs> when, you, yeah. when you're writing a fantasy novel and you start quoting Einstein and Niels Bohr. <laughs> yeah, you know you're having some fun with it. Yeah, and you you may be fading into that uh, cross genre material. Oh, it is it is so hard to put that into a uh, into a category. I tell you, when I pitched this idea to Tony, Tony Weisskopf, main pitching. publisher, yeah. <laughs> So I'm trying to I'm trying to explain this to her. It's like, oh, it's this and it's this and it's this and it's this, and she's just like, okay, I'm just gonna have to read it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it turned out okay. Well, so over the course of the series, your main character is, is Jake Sullivan, and he's gone from sort of a Raymond Chandler s down and out PI who was who was really honorable guy underneath this gruff exterior, but not exactly a power player in world politics and et cetera. And now in Warbound, he's a guy who is humanity's last chance to escape a fate that's really worse than death. Um, can you tell us about Jake's basic magical power and how it fits in with the Grimnor universe? What is a heavy? Um, yeah, 
the, the I, well, each magical power, I I gave sort of a 1930s style slang nickname. Jake is a heavy, and a heavy is somebody who controls the direction and strength of gravitational pulls. Now, he is special in that he's far smarter than your average heavy, and he's put a lot of effort into understanding it, so he's kind of taken his abilities to the next level where he's really kind of messing around now with mass and density. And uh, most heavies are uh, kind of have the reputation of being dumb lugs and are mostly just used as human forklifts, um, that sort of thing, because they can pick up really gigantic heavy objects because they can alter temporarily alter the gravitational pull on that item. Um, you know, he's a he's a, a veteran of World War One, and he was a machine gunner. And you use a heavy as a machine gunner because basically you would give him the really really big gun, and he could just run around with it like it was a rifle. And uh, but Jake uh, came and he was a war hero. He um, came back from the war, and he's kind of an idealist at that at that time frame when he's a young man. And um, he got into trouble with the law because he went to defend somebody from a corrupt sheriff and wound up squishing them, <laughs> is the best way to put it, and uh, went to prison. And uh, was doing, he was doing hard time, manual labor, for six years. And the whole time he was doing this, he was experimenting with magic. And uh, so when the book opens up, this guy has learned more about his magic and how it works. He's, he's basically an autodidactic genius, though you don't realize that just by looking at him. And yet, I mean, the guy's very, very, very intelligent, but he he's not well-spoken, so most people think he's dumb. But he spent six straight years just pondering on the nature of magic and how it works. Uh, so when the book opens, he's been um, sprung from prison early uh, as part of a program where he's helping J. Edgar Hoover... Um, he's basically the muscle they call in to capture dangerous magical people, dangerous magical fugitives. Um, and so that's how the that's how the book opens up. That's hard magic. Yeah, that's no. how hard magic opens. And then the series goes on. Um, basically, Jake gets embroiled with this uh, uh, magical secret society. That's the Grim Noir, and um, their their overall mission is to protect people with magic uh, from the non-magical people and to protect the world from magical people. Kind of a self-policing uh, organization. Kind of, a bunch of idealists, really, but they, they mean well. And uh, Jake gets caught up in their uh, battle against the Imperium, which is my version. Of, it's a, a very magic... It's a magical imperi uh, Imperial Japan, is what it is. And as the series goes on, Jake is uh, part of that lore... And uh, then it gets really interesting when we get as the series goes on, we get into where magic comes from and the fact that magic actually has thematic complications that come with it. I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but something is coming to eat it. And uh, Jake becomes one of the primary guys uh, on a quest, basically, to stop this uh, this enemy from destroying the world. And, uh, yeah, it, he's a great character. Um, well, basically, you... I mean, like I said, I grew up reading a lot of... Chandler and uh, you know Continental Op, and I wanted to I wanted to have a character like under that kind of the honorable the honorable guy that's uh, the hero, um, you know his own his own remorseless code of justice. You know they're rough, they're tough around the edges. You know good heart and do the right thing even if it costs them. And he's one of my favorite characters. I've, I love writing Jake Sullivan. Yeah, he's great. Um, he gets more and more powerful over the course of the books. I was wondering if you had to um, figure out ways to keep him sympathetic as he becomes like a really, really powerful magic user, because he's he's hard to kill. He, he, he it's hard to put him in jeopardy. I guess you had to come up with harder and harder villains. Ah, uh, yeah, it's kind of there's that there's the incremental power creep. Now the thing is, he's always. He's always human and fallible, which is the nice thing about Jake. And a lot of the wounds that he takes as the series goes on, um, they're not physical. I mean, they're, uh, I mean, I, no, no spoilers, but the guy takes some huge, uh, huge emotional blows as the series goes on. As people close to him die, um, as, as bad things happen, either as a result of things that he did or he made the wrong call, another, you know, people paid for it. And this dude's got all this pressure on him, 
it's, it's, so there's, there's that element. Now, physically, as the series goes on too, I get to introduce other villains. And there's a few that, um, that are just awesome. We have a really good time with them. Uh, I, I have a reputation as being an action writer. And I think that the action sequences in the Grim Noir Chronicles are, are the best things I've ever done. And we have some action set pieces that are just fantastic. Um, we have a, in the second one, basically a giant kaiju monster sequence that is just fantastic. And so I think, so even though at that point Jake is really, really, really potent, I mean, he's a really powerful individual, it doesn't matter when you're fighting Godzilla. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They, I, they, I, yeah, these are really awesome uh, action-filled adventures. So let's talk about Warbound. So Jake and a few Grimnor knights have learned that the power, this thing that makes magic in the world, has an enemy, that, like enemy with a capital E, whose prey is the power itself. And we, we have that, and then we have this cool 1933 uh, setup where, where, like you said, you have the Imperium, which is the sort of a fascist Japanese totalitarian state. And the uh, the communists are around, right? Uh, yep. What what are the particulars of the uh, what 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 is Jake dealing with as the series as the novel begins? Well, uh, the politics are, do play a big part of this, mostly because of my history. Not, not, I find that the interwar period uh, to me is one of the most fascinating periods in, in history um, because it was this great period of uh, conflicting, mutually exclusive political philosophies. And, uh, you know, I, I don't put any of this up front in the book, but it's kind of back burner. And it's there. And uh, part of that is that you have these incredibly powerful, horrific governments rise to power during that time period where people were just assets on a balance sheet and you could do whatever you wanted to. And uh, one of the things I did uh, in this world is, you know, most alternate history in this time period, it's Nazis. You know, Nazis make great villains, but they've been done a million times. So in my world, I had Adolf Hitler get shot to death in 1927. So boom, no Nazis, I was done. <laughs> you know, didn't have to worry about Nazis. Um, the world uh, at this point, we're it's still kind of recovering from World War II, or sorry, World War One, the Great War, the Great War. They didn't have a second one yet, so it's just the Great War. Um, it ended a lot more violently in my world than it did in real life because. Um, Germany and the Allies both developed uh, magical uh, units to fight. And at the end of World War I, they unleashed the most horrific destruction of any battle in human history. It was Second Psalm in this world, and that's where Jake, Jake, Jake Sullivan was there for that. Uh, and so they wound up actually ending the war by obliterating the city of Berlin with a Tesla-designed superweapon called the Peace Ray. And uh, so they obliterate Berlin, and now Berlin is just this blackened hole in the earth. Um, <laughs> it's now called Dead City, uh, but we'll get to other reasons for that. But um, So the world is rather different. Um, the Soviets um, are still the Soviets, only they're doing all this. Just imagine the Soviet Union if you gave them magic, and uh, they're just as bad as you think. Mm -hmm. And then in the east you have the Imperium, which uh, in this case – doesn't diverge historically too much, except that the most powerful wizard in the world is actually their their leader. And it turns out that he was actually one of the very first people ever to have magic, and it's the chairman. Uh, and he is one of my favorite villains of all time, and he is malicious and awesome, and it seems super evil, but everything he does has a reason for it. So, I mean, I, I love using the Imperium as the main antagonist in this, because... Uh, I mean, Imperial Japan in real life was horrific. I mean, they were, they did horrible, horrible things. And, uh, just imagine that only now fueled with the magic to alter the laws of reality. So we had a lot of fun with that. Yeah. I mean, the book, they've, they have basically conquered China and Shanghai is a, a so-called free state, although it's a suzerain tree of the Imperium. And a lot of action takes place in Shanghai. Yeah, uh, I, I said about half of Warbound takes place in, in uh, Shanghai, and it, it's uh, it's called the Free City, but it's only free basically in the extent that the Japanese say, okay, yeah, you, business can be conducted here, but they really, their secret police watch everything, control everything, um, and they're just utterly ruthless. But there's a there's a bunch of free cities around um, the, the the Pacific there, 
where it's places the Japanese have not conquered, but basically just out of it's convenient for them. Um, and so a lot of it takes place in Shanghai. Uh, a big part of the villainy is the uh, Tokubetsu Koto Kisatsu, which is the special secret police force um, who are trying to hunt down the, the Grim Noir Knights that are there in Shanghai on this mission. And Shanghai is a really cool setting, actually. And historically, 1930s Shanghai was nuts. <laughs> I mean, it was a crazy town. And so I just was able to use all the existing Shanghai stuff and uh, tweak it a little bit for this magical world. And a lot of a lot of actual real uh, historical characters show up during that too. But because they're from Shanghai, there's a, uh, a lot of people that Americans won't recognize. But uh, yeah, I loved using Shanghai as a setting. <clears throat> And so the first two books take place primarily in the United States. Uh, and this one, you know, there's quite a bit takes place in Berlin and then quite a bit uh, takes place in Shanghai. Yeah. But, um, to... North Pole. <laughs> oh, in the North Pole, yes. North Pole. Wonderful yeah. sequence there. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a fun scene. Well, let's move from from this big picture down to uh, to some of the cool things that you you throw in there. One of the great things about the Grim Noir books is the magic gadgets you come up with. Um, in this one, you have this cool airship. Can you describe the Traveler, where a lot a lot of the action takes place on the Traveler? Yeah, yeah. Um, you can't have a you can't have a 1930s alternate history fantasy without Zeppelins and dirigible. You, you, you just can't. Um, so what it is, one of the main characters. Um, is the, uh, from a company called UBF, which is United Blimp and Freight, which is my alternate universe biggest, most important company in the world because they are the biggest airship builders. And the Traveler is their basically test bed of all new super science based technologies. Because one of the magical powers in the, in this universe is what's called a cog. And that's an individual who's already a genius, but they get these bursts of magical brilliance. Um, and so in, that, in my world, that's why by 1932, 1933, uh, airships are still the primary uh, transportation rather than aircraft, is because um, uh, Graf Zeppelin was a cock. And so he had all these technologies that basically we would not invent uh, in real life until, you know, the 1990s, 19, 1990s, 2000s. So I actually did my research on airships to make them a little more plausible for this. So the Traveler is this double hold, uh, basically 180 to 200 mile an hour airship um, that can circumnavigate the world on uh, on the, using the hydrogen in its bags for fuel, and it's fun. And it, I mean, it has a has a radar, uh, which is like this new exciting invention in 1932. Let's see what else. it's it's. Um, about as armored as you can get, has lots of guns on it. It's the fastest thing in the, well, fastest airship there is. And, uh, we did some crazy stuff with it. And because it's a test bed, uh, I can do really high altitude stuff, <laughs> which enabled me to do some cool stuff. I got a little golden age sci-fi in there with the, uh, you know, your bubble oxygen helmets and that kind of thing. And we get to do a space jump at one point. <laughs> yeah, that, that was awesome. a cool. Cool sequence. Now that scene, that scene was. I, I, I won't, I'll avoid spoilers, but <laughs> I loved writing that scene, um, and uh, that was fun. But yeah, the traveler is, is um, kind of a character in this, and I get to populate it with a bunch of uh, characters from all the across all the series, and um, including I have pirates, I have uh, airship pirates from the first book. I am able to bring back and have them pilot or uh, crewing and captaining this uh, traveler. So it, yeah, it was a blast. The Traveler is a is a fun, and it's named after uh, it's named after a character uh, that everybody thinks is dead. Um, so they actually name it in her honor, and she's she's not dead. Yeah, not <laughs> the, not hardly, as we'll find. <laughs> so. Yeah, hardly. Yeah. Um, but she wants everyone to think she's dead. Right. So she's very honored. They name they name a ship after her later on. But uh, well, there's a there's a cool drawing of this. I should we should mention that there's interior illustrations um, throughout the throughout Warbound, and they're really cool. Are those uh, Alan Pollock illustrations? Oh uh, no, those are from Zachary Hill. Uh, Zach Hill's a he's a friend of mine, and Zach's a really capable artist. He does a lot of different stuff. And so when I first started talking to Zach about this uh, project. He started showing me different designs, and I kept sending him back saying, "Nope, pulpier, nope, pulpier." <laughs> I was like, "I wanted, 
I showed him old issues of Black Mask from like the 1930s, and I was like, I want that. I want simple, fast, basic ink drawings. And uh, the reason being is because as we find out in the third book, um, all the drawings, all the all the interior artwork from all these novels, um, you don't realize it till the third book is that it's actually in world. It's actually coming from some. All the artwork is coming from somebody in the book, and. Uh, that was kind of a fun little reveal in the third one. And also the glossary. We have uh, glossary artwork by Justin Otis. Um, and the glossary, that's all in-world also. Um, so the whole idea was that everything in the book uh, is not written by us now. It was written by the people. Uh, it's written by the characters. So, um, yeah, the artwork is a lot of fun. And it's, it's kind of cool because people have been like, oh, this artwork is very basic. I didn't like the artwork. Go back and pick, open up a magazine from the 1930s and, and see what the ink drawings look like, and he nailed it. And that was exactly what I asked him to do. So I think it came out really good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool. And there's a wonderful uh, the drawing of the Traveler there. Now, speaking of trying to, to make it feel like it's sort of an artifact from, from that age, you put in a lot of epigraphs, epigrams at the beginning of chapters. Now, some of these, they're from characters in the book, but they also are attributed to real historical characters like Churchill, Chesterton, and others. And they're really fun to try to figure out. So have you manufactured all of these whole cloth, or are some of them real, or, or where do these come from? Um, I'm a history nerd, so I collect quotes, and um, the whole idea behind them was that I could do a whole lot of world building without having to take people out of the story and explain world stuff. So I would just have these, you know, chapter headings, and most of them are from real people where I took an existing quote that they actually said, and I just tweaked it um, to fit the current events of my world. So that's how a lot of them fall in. Others I just manufactured completely, um, and either either from real people or from people I made up, but I always try to, if they were from real people, I would always try to read um, actual writings of theirs and then try to write in the same manner that they actually did. That way they'd come across as more authentic. And I think I pulled that off because people go through this and they don't realize, uh, or they can't figure out which ones are real and which ones aren't. Yeah, it's um, really fun to uh, to to try to figure that out. It, it takes you into that world and makes it feel like you're reading something that was written in that world as as it were but larry guns let's talk about, you're an expert on weapons you're certified firearms instructor an award-winning shooter and you were involved in the gun business for years and the one thing we get in all of all of your books is this awesome variety of firepower can you sort of talk shop for a bit and tell us about some of the weapons the characters use in warbound and which are your favorites sure. oh man there's so many guns um Sullivan keeps winding up at various points in time with a Lewis gun. Uh, uh, it's a Mark III Lewis gun, which never actually existed. Uh, they only made the, up to the Mark II. But that was the gun that was issued to the heavy machine gunners in, uh, in the Great War. Uh, he also winds, because John Moses Browning is a character in this series, and he's the greatest gun inventor ever in real life. Uh, only in my world, he's still alive. Um, and so he, he has produced a few new things. Uh, was Browning a uh, cog? Yes, Browning, in my world, Browning was a cock. In real life, he was just a super genius gun designer. In my world, he was a super genius gun designer who also has bursts of magical brilliance. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't just stop at the Model 1911, and then I have the Model 1921, uh, which is basically a, kind of a, kind of a super mocked up 1911 with a 14 round mag, and basically I took all the stuff that we've done the 1911s over the last hundred years. And I uh, stuck him into this gun. And then, uh, he has a, Sullivan winds up with a prototype, uh, uh, bullpup BAR. But the BAR is a fantastic gun. Yeah, he, he uses that a lot toward the end. What is that? Uh, in real life, the BAR is a, uh, it's a, a 20, 20 round, 30 out 6, uh, automatic rifle. It's a really heavy, big gun. Got, it saw a lot of use in World War II. It was actually invented at the end of World War I. Big, heavy rifle. If you ever have a chance to shoot one, they're fantastic. They're one of my favorite guns ever. And then the British actually asked for a prototype in real life that was a, a bullpup, which was it means that you take the stock off, move the action back into the stock, put a pistol grip up in front of the magazine, 
uh, in front of the action, and so you shorten the overall length, and you can't shoot the left-handed anymore because now brass will hit you in the face, but you can shoot it right-handed. So Sullivan winds up with this prototype um, that he uses through most of the series. Plus, in my world, John Browning can actually engrave magic onto the guns, so it is a magic gun, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> which makes it tougher and better. Um, yeah, so it goes through. I mean, and then I use all sorts of period guns. Um, a lot of, oh my gosh, Winchester Model 12s, uh, Remington Model 8s, all the various different auto-loading rifles. I made up a bunch of um, Japanese weaponry um, from various companies. That Heinrich, the German, winds up with a Solo Thern, uh, side-fed Solo Thern rifle, uh, based on an early version of the FG-42. Yeah, I'm a complete nerd <laughs> <laughs> for gun stuff. I try not to keep, I try not to make the gun stuff as overbearing in this one as I did in Monster Hunter. But it's a little more background thing. But you know, when, when you got a bunch of people that make a living off of shooting other people, they're going to appreciate their hardware. Yeah, I mean, and you you make it blend in very well. I'm not. It's not like this is a a book that somebody who's not a gun nerd couldn't get into. It's it's part of the world, and you don't even have to know what these these particular weapons look like or are to understand what's going on. You can get a pretty good idea just from the way the characters are using them. Well, sometimes there's character stuff too, because um, for in Hard Magic, there's a scene where. Uh, uh, Sullivan um, knocks a knocks a European. I won't know spoilers, but Sullivan knocks a German guy out, and he's patting him down, and he pulls out this little thirty-two out of the guy's pocket, and he just looks at him. He's like, Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, Characterization by gun choice, I see. By yeah, because Sullivan's a, Sullivan's a big American man, so he carries mm-hmm. a forty-five. Sure. Proper he, American gun. Yeah. Well, he's so he gets very this big. little thirty-two, and he's like, yeah. Europeans. <laughs> <laughs> one of the big story threads of the book is the one involving Faye Vieira. Is that her last name? Yeah, Vieira. Vieira. Um, who's also very good with guns, whom we've seen in previous novels. She's developed from a sort of 30s mall, fast-talking type to a real power in the in the world of the book. Um, you have a habit of writing these tough girl characters who are very dangerous. I, you know, I'm thinking of Molly, uh, or Holly, I'm sorry, in the Monster Hunter books. And, uh, you know, I've had a peek at Sword of Exodus, and we have a lot with Ling. Um, can you set up for us what Faye's task is in Warbound? Sure. Um, uh, what it comes down to is Faye is, is um, she is kind of accumulation of decades of, of magic itself trying to figure out a way to defend itself from the things coming to kill it and, and it's coming to devour it. And uh, basically, Faye, I, I won't, I'll avoid too many spoilers here, but Faye is very special because of how her mind works. And when the series starts out, you meet her. She's basically a you know teenage girl, oaky, dust bowl refugee. Um, and as the series goes on, you discover that she is incredibly powerful. She's a, she's a traveler. She's, she has the ability to teleport, basically. Um, but she's better at it than anybody else that has her form of magic. Um, and as the series, and I, I planned this since the beginning, which is kind of funny because people read the first review and they're like, or read the first book, and they're like, well, no, she just seems to keep getting more and more powerful. But then they read the second book and they're like, oh, wait a minute, that makes sense why she was getting more and more powerful. Then you get to the third book and you're like, holy crap, <laughs> I see what she did there. Because um, Faye is, um, she's not just powerful, she has a more direct connection to magic uh, than anybody else in the world, uh, for a very specific reason. And you get to, at the end of Spellbound, and you find, or sorry, the end of Warbound, and you find out why she has that special connection to magic, and then everything kind of clicks together. And it's basically, magic itself has picked Faye to be its, um, last line of defense. And, um, the, I won't ruin it for anybody, but Faye is, Seriously, the most dangerous character I've ever written. Like, if I had to pick any character I have in total and, like, have them all fight, Faye wins. <laughs> <laughs> and she is, uh, so she's a psych- kind of psychotic. Uh, by the time this book takes place, she's 18. Um, she is one of my favorite characters ever. Faye is, Faye is awesome. Mm-hmm. And uh, she goes through a lot of growth as, as the series goes on. Yeah, yeah. The, I mean, a lot of this book is about Faye's uh, coming of age story, as it were. So, um, oh, yeah. and 
and the travelers part is really cool. I mean, you do a lot of cool action scenes where where diff- the travelers are using their their uh, powers to show up in unexpected places, and you just it seems like you just had a huge amount of fun figuring out how travelers and fades could could kill people <laughs> or oh, fight. Oh gosh, yeah. Well, one thing I like to do is, I mean, if I give people these magic powers and I said what the rules are to these powers, okay, now take that to somebody who's really good at their job and very malicious and knows how to fight. And then I just started doing all these thought experiments, like what could you do to kind of up your game? And so I had to storyboard these fight scenes um, because when you got a fight scene with five or six different types of magical power, each one twisting one area of the law of physics, and then it can get pretty complicated and, uh, and incredibly violent too. And especially with a fade, uh, which is somebody that can change their density to the point where they can walk through objects. Now, if they're really good, um, if they're, or they can float through objects basically because they, they're basically the matter of the object and their own can just combine and then pass through and then they reform. Um, now if you have somebody who's sufficiently skilled at it, like I have one guy in the book, Heinrich, if it is, he can take other people with him and then leave them there. Yikes. So um, we get some scenes with Heinrich that are just nuts, and he is he is a he is he's great. Um, so yeah, it can get. I mean, you got people teleporting around, walking through walls, shooting fire and lightning and ice, and um, I've got an ice box in this one that uh, a, a kid that uh, can drastically lower temperature, and you think, okay, you know that's cool and all. But then they get a couple scenes and you see what, you know, think about the, what you could actually do by lowering temperature. And it gets pretty crazy, some of the, the, the stuff that you can accomplish with that. Um, so, yeah, it's a, writing fight sequences and action sequences with magic um, is a lot of fun because, I mean, it opens a lot of doors. It enables me to do a lot of neat stuff. Well, one of the things I've seen running through a lot of your books and, you know, across your series even is, is I guess what we in our world might view as conspiracy theories, and they're actually real in a lot of your worlds, the Illuminati and the Templars and Dead Six and the uh, Swords of Exodus, uh, the secret organization of monster hunters and government men in black in the Monster Hunter series, and, you know, the Grimnor here. Am I right about this? Um, why is this stuff so much fun to riff on for you, do you think? Well, it's, just, it's a blast because it hit everybody... Everybody, no matter how grounded you are, everybody has some conspiracies that they believe. Um, and the reason that, that those are so fun is because they all have elements. Uh, they have they all have interesting, compelling story elements. That's how come these things stick around. And so I like to take those things and stick them into my stories because people um, they either believe it or they 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 see why people believe it and they think, okay, that's cool. Um, and in fact, we really get into this in, uh, Dead Six and Source of Exit to the point where it's kind of, a uh, we, we basically take every conspiracy theory out there and tweak them enough so that they would actually make sense and work and shove them into this book. And, and a lot of people don't realize this, but, um, uh, basically on, we have two evil forces fighting, um, for control of the world in the background of the series. One of them is every left-wing conspiracy theory there is, and the other one is every right-wing conspiracy theory that there is, and those are the two sides that are fighting it out. Um, and actually, there's a they even listen to a radio talk show uh, in this book called From Sea to Shining Sea, and the host is, uh, his name is uh, Roger Gioni, and it, Roger Gioni is an anagram for George Norrie, Who's the host of uh, Coast to Coast, which is that late night, uh, a, a late night conspiracy theory radio oh, yeah. show? Yeah. Uh, and so we actually have, you know, from sea to shining sea is the is the is the conspiracy theory radio show in in the Dead Six world. Um, well, there's uh, the that that's gonna that's a really cool novel. Love Swords of Exodus. Um, and now Warbound ends with a heck of a bang. Uh, we don't want to give anything away, but is this the last we're going to see of, of Jake and the Grimnor Knights? Um, well, that, this, this trilogy is wrapped up, so that's it for this story. Um, now, I do have two other novels signed with uh, with Bayon that are um, in the Grimnor universe, but it's different people, different time periods. One's in 1908, one's in the 1850s. 
However, um, after finishing this trilogy, the way, I mean, you notice the way it wraps up. I mean, I really set it up um, that there are a bunch of questions still about what are these people going to do now? And there's some really interesting characters. And I would really like to revisit this in the future. I'm thinking, like, to do another series set about 20 years later, set in the 1950s, where I could get into a lot of the golden age of sci-fi stuff. Um, I mean, the way the series ended up, um, I won't ruin it for you, but there's certain individuals that have wound up together. You're like, wow, that's really cool. And there's other people that are having children. You're like, holy crap, what are their kids going to be like? And uh, one of the running jokes uh, in this book is that Francis, who's a, an awesome character, Francis starts off as this basically spoiled rich kid. He's actually a really awesome character. And as the series grows on, uh, Francis actually grows from spoiled rich kid into, a, into an actual leader, mm-hmm. um, especially in, in Warbound, where he has to basically throw down against SDR. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's this great there's this great part where he's he's there and he's like you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna run for president and uh, his uh, his uh, his accountant is Raymond Chandler and uh, Raymond Chandler looks at him and goes you're, you're, that's a great idea in ten years you're you're too young you have to be 35 to run for president and Francis is like when did they come up with that stupid rule yeah. <laughs> and Raymond Chandler's like ah oh, there's a product of our finest prep schools. But, um, and so I just, and as the series went on there, I thought, wow, you know what? It would be really cool to have, you know, in the 1950s, Francis as president. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and if you were, I won't, you know, won't ruin anything, but you know who that, that means who the, who the first lady would be, which is even crazier. Well, I know, and the readers can find out by buying Warbound. <laughs> So, so I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about the new Monster Hunter novel, Nemesis. You said this is going to be a Frank book, um, and those that have read the series will know what that means. How's that coming along? Can you give us a couple of hints on what we might expect? Um, this one, I think, is slated for summer 2014. This book's about Agent Franks, um, who is a really, really popular character. can't give away too much about him, but he's this kind of merciless government killing machine. So when you first meet him, you think he's just this dirt bag that inter- uh, intimidates wit- monster witnesses into silence, and he is. But as the series goes on, you realize who and what Franks really is, and he's incredibly awesome, and he's just really, really badass. So people have been wanting a Frank's story for a long time. So a big portion of this book is Frank's backstory, also with the current story that's going on right now, and. Uh, it's, uh, it's written in the third person. It's like Monster Hunter Alpha in that that was a Monster Hunter novel, but it was separate from the regular characters, and it was about Earl Harbinger. This is the same way, only it's about Franks. And the subtitle uh, is Monster Hunter Nemesis, Agent Franks versus the World. <laughs> it's it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, basically what it is is Agent Franks uh, is on the outs with the government. He's kind of on the run. Um, there is a bounty on his head. Uh, he's a, he is a monster. Uh, he is no longer protected. And basically, it's the biggest bounty in the history of all monster hunting, which is going to cause all the various international uh, monster hunter organizations I introduced in Monster Hunter Legion are all going to be after Agent Franks. Um, and all this while he's trying to, so- uh, trying to stop a plot, um, which is why he was uh, kicked out of the government. Um, so it's, it's pretty awesome. And there's a couple of scenes that are just nuts because Frank's is, Frank's is just this relentless, remorseless, awful killing machine. And, uh, so there's just some great sequences with Agent Frank's just doing his thing. Well, cool. Hurry up and finish that thing. <laughs> we're waiting for it. The book we're talking about now is Warbound, book three in the Grim Noir Chronicles. It's alt history, nor urban fantasy, bullets, zeppelins, magic, giant universe eating jellyfish. It's got it all, and it's a lot of fun. It's also new at your favorite booksellers right now. I want to thank Larry Correa for being with us to talk about it. Thanks, Larry. Thanks, Tony. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at audible.com now. If you are not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. 
After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has defeated one long-standing enemy, the Havenites, and reached a truce with another menace, the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Henke, Countess Goldpeak, commands the Royal Manticoran Naval Forces in the Talbot Quadrant, a region allied with the Star Kingdom and on the border of the restive frontier of Solarian space. Goldpeak sympathizes with the rebels, but wants to be careful that whatever help she supplies is in a time and place of her own choosing, not that of her enemies. Her first chance to strike a blow against the Sali Office of Frontier Security and the Frontier Fleet is in the Saltash system. With the help of Solarian battle cruisers, the system governor has impounded Manticoran merchant ships in a deliberate act of provocation. Royal Manticoran Navy Commodore Jacob Savala and his destroyer squadron have arrived in system to release the merchantmen from illegal Sali confinement, and after a devastating display of Manticoran martial superiority, Zavala has the upper hand. The system governor has attempted to call Zavala's bluff, but Zavala isn't bluffing. Not every citizen of Saltash is willing to die for the governor's pride, and dissenting members of the Saltash government and defense forces work quickly to avoid further loss of life to Manti firepower, particularly their own. Here is Part 21 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Let's raise the station, Abijat. Yes, sir, Lieutenant Wilson replied, and Jacob Zavala sat back, watching the tactical plot while he waited. Desron 301 had settled into orbit around the planet Cinnamon. Traffic Control hadn't assigned them a parking orbit for some reason, but HMSK's Astrogator had managed to find one. It wasn't as if there was an enormous amount of orbital traffic to pick a way around, after all. Captain Meow's destroyers remained in orbit around Cinnamon's moon, and Zavala was perfectly content to leave them there. A handful of civilian vessels had moved nervously away from the planet as the squadron entered orbit, but aside from that, things seemed reasonably calm. Maybe that was because the majority of the star system shipping was out rescuing the survivors of Oksana Dubrovskaya squadron. Zavala's lips tightened again at that thought, but it wasn't one he was prepared to dwell upon. Right now, he had to concentrate on other things, and he couldn't pretend he wasn't grateful for the distraction. On the other hand, the other things had the potential to turn into an even more horrendous mess than the massacre of Dubrovskaya's battlecruisers. After all, there had been only 8,000 or so human beings on those warships. There were a quarter million human beings on Shona Station. Which is the reason, as that pain in the Asduenas clearly understands, we can't use Mark 16s as door knockers this time around, he thought grimly. And if there really is an intervention battalion in there, it's going to be one hell of a trick to pry our people loose without getting a lot of other people a lot more personally killed. Unless the station CEO's another meow, at any rate. And what are the odds of that if he's got a stack of gendarmes breathing down his neck? I've got the station commander for you, sir, Lieutenant Wilson said, and Zavala looked up from the plot. Thanks, he said, and turned to his calm. I'm Captain Jacob Zavala, Royal Manticoran Navy, the smallish, dark-skinned man on the comm display said. He was quite unlike the dominant genotype here in Saltash, but despite his diminutive stature and polite tone, no one was likely to take any liberties with him once they got a good look at his eyes, McNaughton thought. Am I addressing the commanding officer of Shona Station? The Manticoran continued in that same courteous yet unyielding voice. I'm Captain Valentine McNaughton. McNaughton replied. I'm the senior Saltash Space Service officer aboard. That weasel-worded evasion of responsibility shamed him, but there was no point pretending otherwise, and this Zavala no doubt understood that. For purposes of shifting blame, Governor Duaneus would be delighted to embrace the legal fiction that McNaughton genuinely commanded Shona Station. 
If McNaughton had ever been foolish enough to forget he simply reigned over the station administratively, while OFS actually ruled everything in the star system, he would have been replaced with dizzying speed. Zavala's eyes flickered, and McNaughton felt his face try to heat at the other man's obvious awareness of that reality. But the Manticoran simply nodded. I believe I understand your position, Captain McNaughton, he said. Unfortunately, you and I are in something of a difficult situation at the moment. There are illegally detained Manticoran nationals aboard your station. I fully realize they were detained, I'm sorry, quarantined, on the orders of Governor Duenos, not those of the Saltash Space Service. The problem is that I've been ordered to retrieve them, and Governor Duenas has been less than cooperative, shall we say? In fact, he's flatly refused to release them. And the reason this is unfortunate is that I'm going to have to insist on recovering them. In fact, my orders are to do precisely that, by whatever means may be necessary. I'm afraid Vice Admiral Dubrovskaya's squadron has already discovered what that means. If those blue eyes had flickered before, they were rock-steady and laser-sharp now, McNaughton observed with a sinking sensation. I informed Governor Duenas I would be sending a boarding party aboard your station within fifteen minutes of making cinnamon orbit, Zavala continued. My pinnaces are en route now. I have no desire to inflict additional casualties, especially not civilian casualties, but my orders are clear and I intend to follow them. That means my personnel will be coming aboard Shona Station very shortly. I don't suppose Governor Duenas has instructed you to release the people I've come to reclaim into my custody? I'm afraid he hasn't, McNaughton replied. May I ask what instructions, if any, he has given you? I've been informed that he declines to release your people from quarantine, McNaughton responded in a very careful tone. Aside from that, I have no specific instructions in regard to this matter. Should I assume that means you intend to refuse to cooperate with my boarding party? Zavala's voice was noticeably colder, and McNaughton drew a deep breath. Your personnel aren't in the Saltash Space Service's custody, he said. Their security and medical treatment are an Office of Frontier Security responsibility under the terms of OFS's management of traffic here in Saltash. Governor Duenas made that point to me rather firmly when his medical staff determined that a quarantine was appropriate. As a consequence, I can't release them to you, however cooperative I might otherwise wish to be. Zavala gazed at him for a moment. Lips pursed thoughtfully. Then the manticoran tipped back in his command chair and cocked his head to one side. May I assume, then, that you're as desirous as I am to avoid any unfortunate incidents aboard your station, Captain? I'm administratively responsible for the safety and well-being of the better part of a quarter million civilians— not to mention a major portion of my star system's industrial infrastructure, Captain Zavala, McNaughton said flatly. I think you can assume no one in the entire galaxy could be more desirous of avoiding unfortunate incidents than I am. I can appreciate that. I trust you can appreciate that my people are coming aboard one way or another— I would vastly prefer for my pinnaces to dock with Shona Station like any other small craft, and for my personnel to come and go with the minimum disturbance of your routine, your civilians' well-being, or the operation of your industrial nodes. Since both of us would obviously prefer that outcome, will you be good enough to issue docking clearance? I suspect Governor Duenas would prefer for me to refuse you clearance, Captain Zavala. Unfortunately... He hasn't specifically told me that, and it seems evident you have more than sufficient firepower available to compel me to at least allow you access to the station. That being the case, yes, your pinnaces are clear to dock, 
although I feel constrained to point out that it's only under official protest. Understand, however, he looked very steadily into Zavala's eyes, that I am responsible for those civilian safety. Should they be endangered, it will be my duty to intervene. He spoke firmly, crisply, and Zavala nodded. I understand, Captain McNaughton, and I assure you my people will have no intention of endangering your civilians. Of course, once they board, they will have to make contact with the frontier security personnel responsible for maintaining the medical quarantine aboard your station. Would it be possible for you to provide them with a guide or a map board to direct them to the quarantine facilities when they come aboard? I can certainly see to it that they have directions, McNaughton replied. And in order to minimize the possibility of any of those incidents you and I both want to avoid, I've taken the precaution of evacuating both civilian and Saltash Space Service personnel from the modules supporting the quarantine facilities. I appreciate that, Zavala said with a thin smile. Hopefully this will be a relatively painless visit, Captain. We'll certainly try to keep it that way, at least. All right, people, Lieutenant Abigail Hearn said, standing at the head of the pinnace passenger compartment. Her image appeared simultaneously on the main bulkhead view screens in each of the other three pinnaces, and she hoped she looked calmer than she actually felt. According to our last update, the locals don't want any part of this. They haven't come right out and said so, but we have docking clearance, and their CO's withdrawn his personnel from the portion of the station between our docking bay and our people. That's the good news. The bad news is that we still don't know how many of the gendarmes stationed here are currently on board, and how many may be deployed elsewhere in the system. But we do know our people are in their custody, and they don't have orders to give them back. She saw the tension in the faces actually looking back at her aboard her own pinnace, and she knew the faces aboard the other small craft of her flight were just as tense, and, well, they should be, since only one member of her entire boarding party had ever been a Marine. Gendarmerie intervention battalions had a well-earned reputation as thugs and enforcers rather than soldiers, but they were at least nominally trained with infantry and support weapons, and there were almost certainly more of them aboard Shona Station than there were Manticorans and Graysons aboard her pinnaces. Obviously, we all hoped these people would be smart enough to recognize reality when it smacked them in the face, she continued. What happened to their battle cruisers should have convinced them it would be a really, really bad idea to make Commodore Zavala unhappy with them. They seem to be a little slow, however, even for Solis. Her timing on the last three words was perfect, and several people laughed out loud despite the tension curdling the pinnace's atmosphere. I have no intention of getting any of you killed, she told them when the laughter had faded. A lot of you were with me and Matteo pulling S.A.R. in spindle, and that's why you lucky souls get to take point with the two of us. The rest of you know the plan, and I expect you to stick to it. We don't want any shooting if it can possibly be avoided. We don't want to escalate any confrontations that don't have to be escalated. Having said that, your own safety is paramount. I don't want anyone killed if we can avoid it. But I'd a lot rather have some solid gendarme killed than one of you, is that clear? Heads nodded, and she nodded back. Once we've boarded, the pinnaces will undock under Lieutenant Zamar's command. Thanks to Captain Zavala's discussions with the station's personnel— we know which module our people are in, and we already know roughly what route we're going to have to take to reach them. While we're doing that, Lieutenant Zamar will take up station on the module. Hopefully we won't need fire support from the pinnaces, but if we need it, it'll be there. Heads nodded again, far more grimly. All right. Remember your briefings, watch your backs, and come home safe. If any of you don't come back in one piece... I'm going to be really upset with you. And you won't like me when I'm upset. Understood? Artsid McGeechan was acutely conscious of how alone he was as the manticorn pinnaces mated with Shona Station's personnel tubes 
and the Manti boarding party swam quickly and efficiently aboard. All of them wore skin suits, not powered armor, he observed, but they seemed to be frighteningly well-equipped with pulse rifles, sidearms, flechette guns, tri-barrels, and grenade launchers. He even saw a few anti-armor launchers he hoped to hell were armed with chemical or kinetic warheads and not impeller heads. They moved with grim, disciplined competence, and he reminded himself he was effectively a neutral. The question, of course, was whether or not they knew that. A slender and preposterously young-looking brunette, with gray-blue eyes and a skin suit showing the rank markings of a senior lieutenant, crossed the bay gallery to him. A massively built fellow, who would have made at least two and probably three of her, followed at her heels in an armored skin suit, carrying a flechette gun casually at port arms while a slung rifle hung over his shoulder. He also carried a pulser in a belt holster and another one in a shoulder holster, and all of his weapons had an ominously well-used look. So did his dark eyes, for that matter. He should have looked ridiculous festooned with so much firepower. Instead, he looked like a man accompanied by several old friends who were ready to help out if he needed them. McGeechan didn't recognize the insignia on his skin suit, but he was pretty sure it wasn't Manticoran. Lieutenant Abigail Hearns, Grayson Space Navy, the brunette said in a pleasantly throaty contralto. McGeechan's eyebrows rose and she smiled. We're Manticoran allies, don't worry about it, she advised him. Whatever you say, Lieutenant, McGeechan said. Lieutenant Ardseed McGeechan, Saltash Space Service. Pleased to meet you. Hearns extended her hand and gripped his firmly. This is Lieutenant Gutierrez, Owen Stedholder's guard. McGeechan felt his eyebrows twitch again, and she shook her head. Don't worry about it, she repeated. Uh, yes, ma'am. McGeechan wasn't certain she was senior to him, but he suspected she was, despite her apparent youth. It was always a bit difficult to estimate someone's calendar age without knowing which generation of prolong he'd received, but this Lieutenant Hearns exuded a quiet aura of competence that spoke of a lot more experience than someone as youthful-looking as her ought to have. "'I suppose we should go ahead and get ourselves organized, don't you think, Mateo?' she said, smiling up at the towering lieutenant, and he nodded. "'I'll get right on that, my lady.' Hearns's eyes flickered as if in amusement at some private joke, but she only nodded, and McGeechan watched her watching Gutierrez as he began briskly and competently sorting out the rest of her boarding party. Then the Saltashian frowned as the pinnaces quietly unlocked from the buffers on the far side of the bay's armorplast. He started to say something about it, then changed his mind as he saw them back out of the bay on reaction thrusters, alter heading, and drift off in the direction of Victor Seven. Surely they weren't going to. His thought trailed away as he remembered what had happened to Vice Admiral Dubrovskaya. Under the circumstances, it was probably just as well not to invest too much confidence in what these people weren't going to do. He considered that for a moment or two, and then, ever so slightly, he began to smile. If they hadn't been gendarme pricks, he might almost have felt sorry for Major Pole's troopers. And in the meantime... Chapter 15 Excuse me, Lieutenant Hearns. Abigail turned and raised an eyebrow at Lieutenant McGeechan. The Saltash Space Service officer gave her an apologetic look that seemed to have an odd, almost gleeful edge to it and extended a tablet display. I'm afraid it turns out we're even more shorthanded than we thought we were, given the nature of the current situation, McGeechan continued, and Commander McWilliams needs me back in her command center, since that means I won't be able to personally guide you to Major Pole after all. Captain McNaughton asked me to give you this. I know it's not as good as having an actual guide, but I hope it'll be good enough. Abigail started a sharp retort, but stopped herself. If McGeechan really did have orders to stay out from between the gendarmes and her people, her yelling at him wasn't going to change anything. Besides, she couldn't blame him, or any of the other Saltashans, 
for wanting to keep as much distance as possible between themselves and anything frontier security could construe as collaboration with Manticore. She took the tablet, but McGeechan didn't let go of it immediately. Instead, he hung on and looked across it at her. As I say, ma'am, it's not as good as having an actual guide, but Captain McNaughton said to tell you he hoped it would help. There was a strange emphasis on the last few words, and Abigail's eyes narrowed. Then they dropped to the tablet and widened instead. I can appreciate your manpower difficulties, Lieutenant McGeechan, she said after a moment. And under the circumstances, we won't detain you any longer. Please pass my compliments to Captain McNaughton. Of course, ma'am. McGeechan released his grip, came briefly to attention, and saluted. Abigail returned the courtesy and watched the Saltashian officer step back a half-pace, turn, and stride briskly away without so much as a backward glance. Excuse me, my lady, but wasn't that supposed to be our guide? A deep voice rumbled behind her, and she turned. That was what I expected, yes, Matteo, she agreed calmly. It seems there's been a change in plans, however. Captain McNaughton and Commander McWilliams need Lieutenant McGeechan elsewhere. And we're just supposed to go waltzing through this space station all on our own, are we? Lieutenant Gutierrez sounded a tad skeptical, and the look he bestowed upon Lieutenant Hearns was remarkably similar to the look certain of her tutors had given her back on Grayson usually immediately after something expensive had gotten mysteriously broken. I'm afraid so, she sighed. The best they could do for us was this. She held up the tablet, and Gutierrez's eyebrows rose. Is that really? He began, then shut his mouth tightly. He hated people who asked obvious questions. Yes, it is, Abigail smiled thinly. Changes things just a little, doesn't it? That's one way to put it, ma'am, Gutierrez acknowledged, still gazing at the tablet. Its display showed a position icon to indicate their own location here in the docking bay, but that was about its only resemblance to the standard electronic deck guide he'd expected to see. A standard guide would have shown them where they were and highlighted a route to their intended destination. The purely schematic layout would have told them when and where to turn, what lifts they needed to take, and what decks they needed to cross to get to Victor Seven. Of course, Lieutenant McGeechan would have been a better and, under the circumstances, a more reassuring guide, and it wouldn't have shown any details aside from their direct route, but it would have sufficed. What Abigail Hearns actually held, however, was a damage control guide from Shona Station's engineering department. True, it would guide them to Victor Seven, but it was intended to get emergency repair crews anywhere they had to go under any conditions. Instead of showing a simple, highlighted route to Victor 7, it showed engineering access ways, ventilation conduits, plumbing, blast doors, emergency bypass routes, circuitry runs, and the exact location of the gendarmerie brig in which the Manticoran spacers were confined. Pity there wasn't time for them to get you a standard deck guide, my lady. Abigail's personal armsman continued. I guess we'll just have to make do with what we've got. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 21, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey to Christopher Cifani and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a 20-cartridge Browning automatic rifle fired 30 6 slug salute of gratitude to Larry Correa, author of Warbound. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. 